Oh, Bose, not again. It's one of those base module 700s that we all know and hate. It's caused so many problems around the world. People commenting on my last video about, uh, you know, when they have the won't turn on fault and Bose wants either not to know about it or to charge too much money and no one seems to know how to fix it. Also known as the Acoustamass 300. Um, and yeah, what are the odds it might be the same as the, the last video I did? So now I have the complete unit. The last one I was only given the main board, um, but now I get to tear down the whole thing. So that's pretty cool. It's got this wonderfully nice glass top. I don't know how strong it is, but the sub is facing the the top. The sound comes out around the edges. Um, yeah, there's definitely no sub at the bottom. Uh, so it has to withstand vibration. Anyone know the resonant frequency of glass? But uh, hopefully it'll be plated. Do I do I do I set it upside down on its glass? Uh, maybe maybe I won't. Just in case. Bunch of screws around the outside. Um, and there are some under the rubber feet, so peel them off and there's um, little screws in the corner. And it looks like a couple there. Um, because this seems to be like a, possibly a plate that will come off separately, actually. It does look like a separate plate, so maybe I'll leave these on for now. And this plate may come off with the guts on it. I won't undo those bottom two unless I have to, because they could be holding... The insides to the bottom plate so we don't want it to all fall off inside so nothing's falling off yet so I think I am going to have to undo these two will it come off Fairly well stuck on still. Is there a screw under this other sticker? Oh, there's a hole there. There's a hole there. I betcha there is. Yep, yeah, we've got one here and one here. Ta-da! So there's uh, screws holding the main board in. And... Not the little ones, the little ones are just holding the sockets down on the board, so don't do those. But these big ones look like they'll take off the main board. It looks exactly like the one that we had last time, at least so far. So I should probably try and identify where the main caps would be. We've got our power, power cable comes in here. So that's going to go through some bits in a rectifier and you can see there's a row of pins there and there so that's going to be our switching transformer. Um, not too sure, can't tell where the main input capacitor is. So, um, but you can see there's like an outline here. So this is our main high voltage section. Try not to get your fingers all over that uh, until you know what you're dealing with. Um, but at least you, you can hold it by the edge up here. Um, and down here for sure, this is all low voltage stuff. So with all the screws out now, it's going to be a little stuck to the metal heatsink from memory. There's a section that is. There we go, it just let go with a bit of a wiggle. Right. You can see our main capacitor here. So, for reference, I see. The main capacitor only connects through the top side. So it was a bit tricky to see, but it's right here. Um, I thought there was a trace on the bottom, but there's not. It's only on the top. There's a couple of uh, cables that you want to be careful of down here. So we've got one flex that just pushes in. Cable to the sub itself, the speaker. And there's our board. Who remembers that from last time? Who can already spot where the offending part is? Well, assuming this is the same problem. Let's test our capacitor. Our main capacitor and make sure it's uh, safe to touch. And yeah, she's completely dead. 
void of charge, so no worries there. Now I should have, I did the wrong thing, I should have plugged it in and confirmed the complaint before doing this, instead of bowling on in, assuming it's probably the same as the last one, but no power tends to mean no power. We have a little light indicator here when it does work, so I think maybe what I do is plug it in at this point and just see if anything does happen. I don't know if I'm barking up the wrong tree. Safety first, when um, working on exposed mains of course, you want to plug in this end first so that if you happen to slip while doing it and get your fingers all over the place you're not going to end up in trouble. Plug this end in last. Well lucky for us there's no indicator and I think from memory I could look back on my last vid but that should go orange. So now we can take some measurements and see what's going on. So about 325 there. Let's flip it over and check some of the other side. Now I can't remember what we've got. I think there's there should be like three or five volts for the processor over here. Um, there's a, a, a minus minus 30 something or minus 15 maybe. So this is uh, one of our switching regulators here. We've got another one just here I think. And of course that one, that transformer there is creating some outputs, so there's a little bit going on. I don't think there's any power factor correction, but I could be wrong. Um, but uh, let's just have a look at, there's like diode there, diode there, um, things going on. I mean obviously capacitors, they should have a voltage on them, so we'll have a look at them. Uh, got to pick a ground point too. We'll pick a ground there and we want to check do we have any voltages happening? Nothing there, nothing there, nothing there. Kind of something there that wants to. It's only 300 millivolts. Anything here? Nothing there. Again a little bit, but it's nothing. It's just a, like maybe a bit of leakage somewhere coming through. What about down here? This is, from memory, our standby circuit. So that's yeah, it's fluctuating, but that could be. I think that's reference to mains, uh, mains, uh, or the primary negative. So yeah. So this is this is on the primary side. So you got to watch that. Uh, you can't pick a ground on the secondary side to measure those. So if we just Pop in here and see if there's something here. Nothing there. Okay, you can't really get under to measure that one. There's a lot of glue here at the moment. This capacitor is also a 400 volt rated cat, and I think that feeds this switching circuit for our secondary supplies there. So let's see if we have 400 on here, because I, I think from memory it comes through this inductor. A little inductor down there. Looking at it from another angle, we've got, um, yeah, this is our 400 volt capacitor. This is our main 400 volt cap, but this is a little one, which I think is fed through this inductor. So if that opens, then we'll have no voltage here. Um, and then that feeds this startup supply. Or whatever it does. I know it has to work or, or nothing works. So we flip the board and we'll check on that capacitor. <laughs> Uh, which is here and we got our yeah 320 so we know that that's uh, that's good that should be switching our supply here let's um cut some of that glue away and do some measurements let's see how fast this um, discharges now that it's unplugged See, <laughs> look how long it takes. So you really want to be sure, even after a minute, it's probably going to hurt. <laughs> so we'll get that discharged and then carry on. Some of this glue can be, 
I mean, it's 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 good in that it stops stuff wobbling, but um, it can be quite brittle in that you can just kind of cut and pull and without cutting other components that might be under it. And then it can if you get a bit of bite on it. You can just sort of pull it and it'll stretch and kind of come off. <laughs> I should have given it a better fighting chance by cutting through the side a bit more. Get a bit of hot air in there. See how soft it gets. We don't want it to melt, obviously. But it does seem to behave like hot glue, oddly enough. So we won't get too close, we'll let the heat soak in toward the middle of it a bit. And that's just 180. We'll see how much easier that's made it, if anything. It's coming. Nice and slowly. You want it to release from the components, you don't want to yank on it and rip them all off the board. One solid piece. How about that? What we need to measure the voltage on this capacitor. Now, for those who remember, the, this diode here is the one that failed last time in the last video. Um, we should probably de-glue that in anticipation. Because I can't actually probe the connection at this end. So here is the offending diode from the last video. Um, since we know this, we could go and just check it. But what if you didn't know that? How are you going to go about figuring out what the problem is? So what I'm going to do next is we're going to measure the voltage on this capacitor and this capacitor and just see if this section of the circuit is working. And remember, this is on the primary side. I could be wrong, but just use the negative of this cap as the reference. And if you're still not sure what that means, basically, I'm going to be probing the pin on that side and the pin on that side. And uh, this is the negative of the capacitor, which I would say would be tied to the one beside it. So probing across that capacitor with it now plugged in, we can see 150 millivolts, really nothing going on there. Not really fluctuating at all. And then if we probe this other cap over here, there's nothing happening there either. From our 400 volt capacitor here, so we've got 320 here, what's this? We've got 300 there, and the other side, 300, yep. So there's definitely 300 volts going in. We need to find out what we need on this IC to make it function. Do we have uh, voltage there? I'd imagine we'd have to drop that 300 down to a working voltage for this IC at some point. What about ceramic here? There's nothing. I'm going to have to trace the circuit out all over again. But before I do, let's just play devil's advocate and stick with what we know and check that diode right off the bat. Make sure there's no voltage across it. I'm not going to blow our meter up in diode mode. 
Here we go. And what have we got for a diode reading? Well, that looks shorted to me. Let's have a look at this one over here, just as a proof. 0.2, that's what we'd expect. The way these operate, um, I can't remember if there's a, is there a, a MOSFET under there? No. So this IC here, without looking up a data sheet, probably contains the switching component for the primary side of this uh, transformer. They tend to be self uh, igniting. So what I mean by that is um, when your mains comes in and gets rectified to DC and you get your four, uh, 300 odd volts develop across the primary winding here, as it's um, building up, it's inducing a magnetic field in another winding, which can then um, be used to power the IC that controls that. So as it builds up, it builds up enough in the first part of the cycle to switch that on, and then that starts oscillating and to continue. So we've got DC build up across here. It's going to get up to the DC level and stop. So when this is switching it to ground, it creates your, your what's well, going to be a square wave. But it's alternating, and, and that causes um, a magnetic field change continuously across that primary winding, which then induces into that other winding to power the chip. So it's self-powering, basically, once it gets the first build-up. Um, and this is probably what that diode there is doing. Um, and because it's not able to kick off that first initial charge, it just doesn't doesn't continue running. We saw that there was no voltage here and here. If you were to trace out the circuit, you would have you would have probably come to that conclusion anyway that um, this is feeding the power to that IC. And obviously, if there was nowhere else that that power was coming from, which is sometimes they have a, a resistor divider, which kind of looks like this, but this is not happening. This is at least where the point that I measured it. And it will drop 400 down to, I don't know, 20 or 15 or something for this chip to run on. But yeah, in circuits where that doesn't happen, it's self-driven. Let's get that diode off and double test it out of circuit. Now, if you don't have a multimeter with low Z option, sometimes you can get that. And that allows you to put the probes across a high voltage capacitor to discharge it. Um, what I'm just using here, I've got uh, a high wattage resistor, uh, it's 180 ohms this one, um, just make sure you don't go too low with it, um, but uh, 180 ohms seems to work fine, and then just stick uh, some leads on it, alligator clips at each end, um, keep that away, and uh, without touching the alligator clips, okay, keep, keep holding the insulated portion, and, and just pop that across the capacitor um, is, is a very much safer way of doing it. You don't want to, like it might be very tempting just to get your screwdriver across the terminals and just, you know, one bang and it's all gone and discharged. And that might, you might get away with that sometimes. But remember, this is also feeding this other little capacitor, this other little 400 volt capacitor here. And if you were to present a short across that, that would appear like a short across this one. It's fed via this little inductor here. There could be enough energy in that to blow that inductor open. So you might short that out and then create a whole nother world of problems. So if you do it through a resistance, it's a controlled current discharge and, and you'll be fine. Here's our diode. There'll be a lot of you out there who want to give it a go and uh, you know, fix it yourself. Um, diodes are easy to obtain. Um, I mentioned in the last video, I think, a number of times where to get it. Um, either response to questions or possibly in the description. But I used the hot air station in that one and none of you home users would probably have a hot air station handy. So we're going to do it the hard way and just use a solder iron. And um, I'll show you how easy it is to do that. Uh, I might just give myself an advantage and cut the rest of the glue off there because I'm going to be getting a solder iron in and around and I don't really want to be melting glue all over the solder iron. <laughs> One sec. Because you've not a lot of room to work in. 
And uh, if you don't have a hot air station, which makes life so much easier, then you just have to watch your surroundings with your, your, your big iron. Right, uh, oh, I should probably find myself another part before I get too carried away. Stand by. As you can see, the number on this one is B2100, which is pretty much... Is that the same on, on the replacement? Yeah, B2100, you should be able to find yourself uh, some valid replacements under that number. Uh, I believe it is a 2 amp 100 volt rated. So what you're going to need is something called solder wick or braid. This can be obtained in many different styles. Um, preferably the one that has uh, flux impregnated in it um, because that's what does all the work. Uh, what helps for sure if you don't have a braid with a flux, of course you can get flux you can just put all over the place like that and then what we're going to do if you have there's there's um uh, solder out there everyone refers to low melt solder um, which is it just melts at a lower temperature range I don't have any of that but um, standard 6040 uh, lead tin solder is um, uh, it's not as good as low melt of course um, but it's less than what they use on here this is a, um, a high temp lead free stuff um, so we're just going to flood the joint with um, with some standard solder and I've got my big tip on here and I've got it set at 400 degrees or 390 because what we're going to aim to do is get a lot of heat through the body of this diode to um, to try and get it off the board and adding adding some of the solder to the ends first is just going to help lower the melting point of the solder that was used originally and uh, we've got more room to work on the right hand side so um, I'll just get some heat into the left side first and then we'll just let that soak in for a bit and then we'll transfer to the right hand side and give it a wiggle you can see that's loose and then see if we can get enough heat to transfer through to the right hand side after it's already been preheated and vice versa there we go just swap a couple of times between them and she's off. Don't go pulling at it if it doesn't feel like the solder's melted. Um, you can be tempted to, 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 to say, oh, it's starting to move, it's starting to move and pull harder, but you end up ripping the pad off the board. You only want to, once it's freely moving, then lift it off. So anyway, we'll get rid of that. There's our, our known bad. <laughs> Gotta have known bad parts. Um, and I'm just going to check um, in diode mode the same way we checked before and it should in theory give me the same reading which is yeah, 0 0.019 definitely a shorted diode now you can actually lower the temp of your iron to go a bit nicer on the pads and so forth grab your solder wick and we're just going to clean off the old solder that's there and soak it all up so you just got to get it hot and let it do its thing you can see it traveling up the wick like magic and then we have a nice clean pad we'll do that to that one there and that's mostly gone keep in mind um, if you of course get this laying on top of other components like that little resistor there um, it will in the right place soak up the solder from that and you'll just need to be aware and go and add fresh solder back on the high temps tend to turn flux into a hard mess so if we clean as we go it'll be easier than trying to clean it once the new parts on now I like to add a bit of solder to one side first 
and then drop the part on while it's liquid. There you go. So, who remembers what way it went? Well, lucky for you, if you forgot, you can reference another diode. So you can see here is a diode and there's a white line representing the cathode which is the striped end and over here we've got the white line on the left so it's going to go that way but remember we could even read it don't take that for granted though they if you, depending on who makes it the, the word the letters might be um, upside down uh, to the line so don't just put it in the way around you can read it always check for the line so now we'll get this molten if you look underneath this whole pad has to come into contact effectively and be flooded and solder so if we get it liquid we can sit it down on that and that'll make a nice connection um, we do that and drop it on and there we go um, you could like it you could sit it a bit further to the right than what it used to sit at and it'll give you a bit more room to get your solder iron in there um, and that would not be an issue at all so what I'll do is just put a bit of flux down as well um, just to help it flow under there and make a good connection now remember you should have bought the good solder that has a, a flux core um, what that'll do for you is just provide enough flux while you're soldering the joint to get the job done and my beefy chisel tip I'm just going to be trying to work with the end of it I'll put some solder on that first and then when I feed that in oh look it flowed in right away oh, I'm going to feed a bit more to it and there we go probably not the end of the world if you don't have access to isopropyl alcohol and can't clean it so let's plug it in and see what happens well I don't see a light okay we may have more work to do there we go plugged it back into the housing and we now have a light I don't have any controls for it or anything like that but uh, the capacitors that we checked on at the beginning of the video now all have voltage as well we have three volts we have five volts we have a whole bunch so I'm pretty confident this is now fixed and the status is probably trying to connect to the sound bar so you can see the amplifier IC down there and it's covered in this blue heat sink compound which is um, also where it mates with the uh, the housing there big thick chunk of metal clearly needs to be um, heat sunk well um, it's quite thick like uh, the gap left um, we can sort of see the level of thickness in the layer that's left on there um, I don't think your standard heatsink compound would be suitable that's why they've used this putty like stuff so I just like to move it around and get it back into the, the sort of the center um, and try and what's what's left although it does go quite brittle and <laughs> yeah yeah it feels kind of moldable actually I think we'll just poke that around and, and get it to sit somewhat proud of the um, top of the IC there so that when we screw it down it's going to mush in and hopefully create a nice thermal thermal connection for us yeah it's somewhat moldable still so once that's screwed down I guess the pressure is going to help spread it and there we have it all happily back together and blinking away so that was once again how to repair the Bose base module 700 also known as the Acoustamass 300 uh, one diode common as mud problem 
And there's a more thorough start to finish explanation on how you can fix your one. But it's sure hard finding good help out there, isn't it? Anyway, thanks for watching. Catch you all next time.